We're going to start off our two days together talking a little bit about new horizons in EE research. Uh, some of the ideas and challenges that we may be facing, uh, where we've come from, where we want to go, uh, and how we can work together on that. And uh, I really appreciate Jason's point about the, the need to work collaboratively on that. Um, which areas of research may be needing more attention uh, and directions in which the EE research field uh, may be heading in the next generation. And one of the things I think about, you know, uh, when I think about this topic, which is, you know, a really important topic for me, is well, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we here? Why are we dedicating our lives um, to this work? And there could be a lot of different reasons for different people. Um, of course, you know, putting food on the table, uh, and having a job is, uh, you know, important reason and, and career reasons that motivate people. Um, some people are driven and put a huge amount of energy into building the field as a strong, vibrant research community as an end in itself. Um, and also people are putting a lot of energy and, and wanting to push that field in, in different directions and saying there's things we need to address potentially as a field in order to make it uh, more just and um, you know, equitable and um, you know, unoppressive for all folks to be able to work in EE and EE research. Uh, there's other people that may be driven by uh, intellectual curiosity and theory and get passionate about that and working with new theories and pushing you know, the boundaries of the, the types of theoretical um, frames that we may use in, in EE and EE research and how they can inform our research and practice. And then other people may also be driven by, you know, probably all of us, uh, societal impact and wanting to make a difference with what we're doing. Um, whether that's uh, affecting policy and curriculum or working with different organizations through program evaluations to improve experiences for learners uh, in, in different sectors, non-formal, formal, formal um, and formal ed uh, and, and other areas as well. So I think there's this range of spectrums that we can and work, work across. And I think you know, one thing as we were preparing for this um, panel too is the you know, the current events, what's, what's happening this week in the news in terms of Kavanaugh and U.S. politics and how that, you know, weighs on us, how the IPCC report that came out yesterday and how that weighs on us. So thinking where we're at now, uh, you know, the urgency of these issues and, and where we want to come together and, and push our field, push our work over the next um, decade. So really grateful to the panelists to, to coming forward and putting some ideas out in a um, little bit of time this morning and look forward to more conversations across the next couple days. So I'll let folks introduce themselves further when they first speak, but we have Catherine Stevenson, uh, Rachel Gould, Charlotte Clark, Olivia Aguilera, and Clayton Pierce as our panelists. So as I mentioned, we're going to uh, do this as a bit of a uh, kind of interview, talk show, uh, you know, get your views on a few different topics. So the one we're going to start with um, this morning is, what do you think have been some of the key directions of EE research over the past decade, in a few minutes or less? <laughs> So, hi. My, uh, okay. There we go. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Katherine Stevenson. Um, I'm an assistant professor at NC State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and first of all, I just want to say how good it is to be here with all of you on the panel and all of you in this room. Um, I think when reflecting on this and preparing to come this week, I was um, kind of struck with how much I miss seeing many of you from the conference getting uh, canceled last year and how important I think this touch point is to me personally and professionally. So it's really good to be here um, and thanks for having us. Um, so when reflecting on um, what I think has been going on in the last 10 years or so, I was sharing with the rest of my panel um, mates here that uh, it, to some degree that's really hard to separate um, the way that I see the direction of the field going with sort of my own development as a researcher, because I'm, I'm still fairly new to this field, right? Um, so I started graduate school in 2011, so I haven't quite been around for a decade. But as in thinking of where I see the field going, um, I think one thing that emerges to me is um, 
what I see is sort of a re-emphasis on environmental education and community on several levels. Uh, so I think this field started from the environmentalist movement, which was very much about community action. And to some degree, I think that's stayed with us throughout. But I think in the last decade, we've seen a, a kind of an expansion of what it means to connect with community, uh, whether that's unit of analysis. Uh, we have a lot of sessions during the research symposium and moving forward about what does it mean to move from understanding the development of learners versus the development of communities and society um, in terms of environmental literacy or um, just environmental learning in general. Um, and we also see this reflected in things like the Community Engagement Guidelines for Excellence. Um, I know Charlotte's going to talk a lot about collective action with environmental ed evaluation. So I see this as all just sort of connecting to this theme of community and EE and how we're thinking about that as a field. And I think that's really exciting. Um, another thing that I, I think that um, connects between EE and society, which I know some of my other panelists are going to hit on even more, is I think a, a re-emphasis on our responsivist, responsivist to, as Marcia is pointing out, these very urgent and emergent issues um, that are going on in society. So in, I think, I think you're, you're right in, in pointing out that many of us have multiple motivations for the work that we do, but sort of a re-emphasis on um, driving toward research to, in response to what's going on in society and making sure our, our work is responsive to that. Great. I'm very excited to be on a talk show. As Marcia mentioned, this really is definitely a talk show. Okay. I'm Rochelle Gould, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Vermont. And uh, like Catherine said, I'm also relatively new to the field. So this is the past 10 years uh, are about how long I've been in the field, maybe even slightly less time. So um, what, what I have noticed, and this comes a lot from the folks that I've worked with, uh, Nicole Ardwin in particular, that, that EE is really expanding its umbrella and, and looking at the question of what is environmental education and expanding that, that sort of idea of what's included in environmental education and particularly looking at environmental ed as being both lifelong and life-wide. So those two key terms for me really represent what I've seen in the literature in terms of environmental education becoming broader and really coming to encompass the entirety of how people are learning about the environment throughout their lives, both in terms of time and in terms of the different activities that they're doing. Um, and so I think that's a really important point to think about this hugely diverse big umbrella that, that, that is now becoming EE, and, and this relates to being able to respond, as Catherine said, to what's coming up, these new emerging uh, challenges and how they require different kinds of responses and different kinds of learning. And a second sort of point really related to that is the question of with whom does environmental education resonate? And, and for what communities is this an important concept and a relevant concept? And it's super intertwined with that question, I think, of what is EE and how big is the umbrella? And at least I'm seeing and really interested in this sort of move from EE as being just about a sort of kids in summer camp model to really expanding to include many, many more ways that people are learning about the environment and how that's affecting behavior. And I guess the last thing I'll say is that the, I think fundamentally that one of the things E is doing is looking at the relationship between people and their surroundings. And when, when we look at that and think about that, we realize that that relationship can take many, many forms. And I think that's a really exciting uh, way forward. Thanks. I'm Charlotte Clark. I'm on faculty at Duke University in North Carolina. Um, I think I get the award for being the seasoned person up here on this panel. And most of the time I'm good with that. I feel very young now in my 60th year. I will confess that my 32-year-old daughter recently, in trying to compliment me and my partner, said, oh, mom, you and dad are so spry. <laughs> OK. But that leads me, as I think about history and my history and the history of the field, the reason that I am where I am is in large part because of this community over the last 10 and 15 years. And the story I'll tell to start out uh, involves my first 
time coming to what was then a re invited research symposium that was led by Paul Hart. And I didn't know any researchers in EE. I was brand new to the field. I had been more of a practitioner in a university setting. I heard, I can't even remember how I heard that this was happening, but I didn't know if I could be invited as a new graduate student in a PhD program. So I contacted Paul by email, and to my great pleasure, he not only responded right back, he not only immediately invited me to come to that, which I was a party of one at Duke at the time in the field. Duke doesn't have a school of ed, much less a program in environmental ed. But he said, that's such a great idea. I'm going to ask every researcher who's coming to bring a graduate student. And we're going to uh, set up some of the sessions so that each graduate student is presenting. And I'll allocate and put our researchers in various places so that every grad student will get some feedback from some of our uh, more seasoned researchers. It was a really brilliant format. Uh, here we are 15 years later, still going strong, Paul. Not only did I begin to meet some of my best friends and colleagues in EE, but also those grad students, many of them have continued to be some of my best friends. As I reflect on that, I think about the fact that some of those people I don't see here, and it's made me think about what we consider the academy, or the field, when I say I'm in the field, or this is my academy, this is my academic home. Um, and Paul, I think about MJ Barrett, who uh, I don't see at these this now. She's at the University of Regina. She was one of those grad students working under Paul at the time. Although the areas she's working in are still very aligned with many of us in this room. She thinks about human nature relations. She thinks about indigenousness and other kinds of methodologies. Um, so she would absolutely fit in here. We would love to have her here. Um, and I know she's finding some other wonderful academic homes, and perhaps we can pull her back in at a future time. I'm going to come back to that in, in a future comment. But what I want to say now, just to as a teaser, is if I think about where there are clusters of research happening, whether that's someone who considers I might be the only person at Duke doing some of this, although I've learned that's not true when I took the time to look about me. Um, uh, we have some places that we don't see people coming from as much anymore. Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois, Ohio State, and, and if you are here, uh, you know, please come up and let me know. I'd love to know that we are reinvigorating those locations and then we also have some new places. You know, Catherine has got a new vibrant uh, group of um, researchers happening at State. And Nicole has a new vibrant group of researchers uh, at Stanford. We have, and then we have some that have been around for a long time and are continuing to be so vibrant, including Martha Monroe at Florida and Marianne Krasny at Cornell. And I'm sure there are others I should be mentioning. But I'm going to come back around to thinking about what does it mean to think about those clusters? Why are they there? Where else do we wish they were? What does it mean to be a field and a community? So with that teaser, I will pass it off. Thank you, Charlotte, for that. Um, and I want to be brief here because I asked my panelists if I could spend most of my time on the next question rather than this one. And I think they've covered well. Um, uh, the evolution. I, I'm sorry, my name is Olivia Aguilar. <laughs> I'm an associate professor of environmental studies at Denison University. And I um, see my colleagues back there. Shout out. Um, so thanks also for inviting me to be part of this panel. I think the thing uh, that Charlotte just said that resonated with me is, um, is, the, is the evolution of this field in terms of who's part of it. And I think what I've really found perhaps exciting um, certainly challenging, but also promising is the interdisciplinarity brought to the field. I think that's really important for us in terms of how we grow. Um, I think that um, both Catherine and Rochelle have, have put nicely sort of the things that I've, I've seen more attention to in the field over time. And like Charlotte, I've been in the field a, a, a while too. Um, and then the only thing I think I would add there is just the attention to climate change education, I think, has been really important for the field uh, and seeing how that evolves. Um, I would argue, um, and I think uh, Alan set up this up nice for us, um, that there's obviously room to grow in these areas. And so um, I'm just interested in seeing how we evolve sort of in the things that we've already begun to do. OK, and so with that, I'm going to pass my mic on. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone for inviting me and letting me join in this conversation. I'm honored. 
Uh, my name is Clayton Pierce. I am a professor at Fairhaven College of Interdisciplinary Studies at Western Washington University, so Bellingham, Washington. Um, let's see, I'm, I guess I'm sort of situating myself within the field of EE. I guess I'm sort of an outsider. I come from sort of the educational foundation standpoint, so if you don't like, like what I have to say, then you can say that they're not part of EE, so. <laughs> um, so I guess in me thinking about this question about the new directions, I sort of um, went to, I think, three key areas of literatures and debates that I've seen going on in the field, some that um, both I've used in my publications, but also I think in my own work, um, in particular around food justice and food security, both in the K through 12 context as well as now higher education. Um, so let me just highlight three of those uh, particular areas that I think are sort of exciting new directions, powerful and rich new directions in the field of VE. Uh, the first one sort of being, uh, I generally sort of framed it as a neoliberal policy reform context in EE. So asking questions and thinking deeply about what does the field of VE mean within the context of um, corporate reform, right? This plays out on a lot of different levels, one from getting grants, which I've been a part of. I'm very much embedded in all of this, so um, I'm thinking through this at the same time. What does it mean when we're asking for money, working with programs, working in institutions that are very much driven in market solution formats? I think there's some serious questions embedded in that, especially if we're doing work that focuses on environmental justice. Um, I'm going to have more to say on that in a second in my further comments. Um, the second sort of area of literature that I want to point out and highlight is critical whiteness studies in place. Um, I think this is another really exciting and important conversation going on in the field. Um, why? Because I think that, as I'm going to talk about in a second, whiteness in particular is embedded in, in ways we think about the environment, ways that we do our practice, and in particular how we think of land in place in possessive ways. And I'd like to add to that too, that's a rich area to think about uh, toxic masculinity as well. So I think that's a really rich area to think about within the field of environmental education and what it means in our work and research. And the third area, and these are all connected, I would say, too, um, is settler colonialism in, in EE. Um, so what does it mean to do environmental education in place? Who's involved in those conversations? Um, what does it mean to be doing work on lands and research and working with students? who are asking questions, for example, uh, students that I'm working with are asking questions, what does it mean, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically to about white students in this case, what does it mean to be doing work on this farm and on this land that is Salish Sea people's lands? What does that look like? What does responsible relationships look like that we could move forward thinking about the practice of envir environmental education? Um, so those are sort of the three areas, key areas that I want to point to, and I'm going to speak sort of a little bit more on each of those in the further questions. I'll turn it back to Marcia. Thank you, everyone. So transitioning from there to thinking about, you know, some reflections over the past decade, uh, ask you now to address what you see as key new horizons of work uh, that need more or further attention in EE research in the coming decade, and why you think those areas are, are so important at this time. We'll start with you, Clay, please. So that, so that comes right back to me. <laughs> okay, so as I said, I want to break apart sort of those three areas real quickly and how I'm thinking about those in my research and why they need more attention. So I want to start with the question of sort of neoliberal policy reform. Um, and so what do I mean here? Um, this is sort of not a new question. I think it's been debated and it's been published about both in the field of environmental education and outside of edu um, environmental education. Um, but sort of what I want to think about is what does it mean when top-down governing models of sustainability development that promote the green, blue, and GMO revolutions have the resource clout to impact at a scale that is hard to imagine. So from my point of view and work, this is one reason we need to focus in E on the neoliberals embedded in top-down models of sustainability in all facets, and most importantly for us, educational models. Um, and so here I'm not only talking about simply the sort of the budget mechanisms of where we get our money, what directs our money, and sort of the ways in which research is shaped. But also, um, and here I'm thinking in particular in the K through 12 context, I think um, there's interesting links between how we measure students' learning, right? Um, 
that are applied um, in ways that teach students to think about themselves, in particular about um, what environmental education could look like. In other words, if we're valuing ourselves as students who perform and produce and we can measure that, that has a direct effect on how we're thinking about environmental education, right? It shapes the way we're thinking. Um, I think Wendy Brown sort of calls this soft power in the ways that it shapes how we think and who we are, and in particular, I think, in the connection of environmental education context. Um, so that's, I wanted to break, break that down a little, a little bit in terms of the neoliberal sort of governing models. Um, I also think this is connected to, and this comes back to this question of whiteness, in particular, and what whiteness, critical whiteness studies sort of role in this is to me. So again, um, this is me as well thinking about this in my own work. I'm thinking about it every day. I'm thinking about it in my conversations with my students, what this looks like. Um, and I think key here again is focusing on how whiteness, and, and I would add to it too sort of um, patriarchy is connected deeply here, how land and how we think about land in place in sort of an accumulatory and possessive way. In other words, how, and I'm going to put it on, on me here, um, how I've been socialized to think about land in place in very particular ways and how I've been raised to think about it in very particular ways, right? I think EE needs to, um, and at least this is how I'm thinking about it in my work, how do we engage in practices that challenge that way of thinking about land that is connected to, for example, indigenous erasure, indigenous erasure and dispossession from land, right? Um, one of the contexts I work on is a, now is a campus farm at Western, and that's some of the questions we're sort of asking. What does that look like again, working on this farm that isn't our land, and when five miles away from us is delamination, for example, right? What would relationships look like that built with them um, look like that were responsible, but then also created, that this is we're tying it back to education, creates an environmental education context to lead to spaces and conversation for white students that can challenge that possessive ethic of land that I think I certainly was socialized into, right? I think that's a really sort of important piece to think about. Um, and then finally, I'm going to end it. I'm going to end it there because I think I'm going to speak to some of this in, in my in my last point and turn it over so I make sure we're on time. Thank you. Okay, so this is where I asked to spend most of my time talking about it, but I, I appreciate um, Clayton's sort of contextualizing his work from his perspective, and, his, and and so I want to do the same with my work. This is definitely a personal story in terms of. Um, what I believe are sort of could be new horizons in the field. And so I just want to contextualize this by saying that I started writing this piece um, on Saturday, October 6th, as U.S. Senators were preparing to vote in the newest Supreme Court justice. Um, so I, I was at a point of rage when I was writing this to the point where I almost couldn't write it and felt very angry that I was even having to engage in this work. And so I reached out to my panelists and told them where I was and the place that I was in. And questions like, is there a place for rage, right, in this symposium? And luckily, Charlotte said, yes, go for it. There's a place for rage. How can you? I'm sure you can fit it, right? So, um, so thank you for that. And then, and then everybody chimed in and said, yes, go for it. So I, I wrote this out of a place of anger, but I also think as I sat with it, I was able to realize that it's actually my scholarship that has allowed me to explore new tools in which to articulate and explore this anger that I often feel. Um, so I want to talk about the new horizons that I've experienced in my scholarship that have liberated me in ways that I did not expect. And then the role of that scholarship in the field and how I think it can work towards human liberation in the field. So exploring scholarship and ideas posed by women of color has resonated with me in ways that I did not expect. Um, I feel like I've opened in some ways a Pandora's box that I can sort of never return to where I was prior to this work, um, I began to explore more personal and autobiographical methods that many women of color have turned to to address issues of justice and equity. And not only has the methodological exploration been liberating, but so has the examination of intersectional theory. And so I just want to talk briefly about intersectional theory. Um, it was first used by Crenshaw in 91 to explain how the intersection of identities are not only important to understand the complexity of marginalization and violence for some people, but also that they cannot be teased out or disjointed. She noted that although racism and sexism re readily intersect in the lives of real people, 
um, they seldom do in feminist and anti-racist practices. And so when the practices expound identity as woman or person of color as an either or proposition, they relegate the identity of women of color to a location that resists telling. And that was, that's from Crenshaw. Um, it is the telling then, I think, that many intersectional theorists are arguing for. And I think it's something as a field that we need to be open to, responsive to, and attentive to. Um, further, I think intersectionality can be used in EE to illuminate inequities, marginalization, and racial, sh racial silencing in our field. For example, Hannah Miller's work, is Hannah here? I don't think if she's here. She's not. She's not here, she's bummer. Um, uh, in 2017, used a critical race theory rooted in critical feminism, critical theories of place, theories of decolonization, post-colonialism, in an attempt to develop a critical consciousness of race and place-based pedagogy. Um, turning to Sarah Ahmed's Living a Feminist Life also provided me with the liberating tool of the sweaty concept, which I think is a beautiful tool. A sweaty concept is uh, work that lays out other paths, paths that we can call desire lines created by not following the official paths laid out by disciplines. And so that, again, was very liberating for me, that I didn't necessarily have to follow what was already um, laid out before me in the discipline. Um, through, um, to this end, I'm constantly questioning which paths have been laid out by the discipline and which ones we can create by stepping out of the lines. Through the constant questioning, questioning and the desire to tell, I began to see how working within the confines of a dominant Western paradigm can be constrictive, if not suffocating. Once you begin to unpack the, system, the systemic patriarchy, racism, heteronormativity, you begin to see how entrenched the systems really are. In this vein, I think that an examination of our field is one that not only works for the sanctity of ecosystems, biodiversity, and charismatic species, um, but also human liberation, meaning free of oppression, should be further explored. Ultimately, I would like to see that the new horizons in our field seek more just ways of research and practice that will allow us to identify and dismantle white supremacy, as Clayton um, eloquently talked about, heteronormativity, patriarchy, and colonization. And I think we're on this path. Um, so the next sort of question is the challenges towards doing that. And so I'll address that later. Thank you. Wow, this is fantastic. I want to build off of those remarks and come back to the thought of community of who we are, what it means to be our community. The examples I gave earlier, I, I want to acknowledge, I forgot to say, was very much of a US-centric set of examples. These kind of clusters and places where we work are all over the world, thank goodness. Um, but as we think about where we are in our work, some of us are at schools of education, some of us are at schools of natural resources, some of us are at schools of forestry, some of us are in areas of tourism and recreation. Um, and we are all, our, our field is a very applied field. Um, and so even that when we sit in these places, they, in the end, we are thinking about application, which, which is at once both incredibly wonderful and also very daunting if the place where we want to be and are is in the research arm of that. But where do we want to be? Sometimes I think it's easy to say, oh, we can't choose where clusters of EE research and practice are at universities and at institutions of higher ed. We can't choose those because they choose who they hire. And, and we're not in control of that. But I'd like to just challenge that and argue that a minute because I'd like us to think about where do we want to be in the world doing our work. And I don't necessarily mean the sites of the work. I mean our home bases, where we get our funding, where we find our colleagues. Um, and how do we get there? And um, I, in the end, I think it's very personal, and I think it's about stories. Here's a question. If you have read an article, when you have read an article in a journal, one of any journal, hold up your hand if at any time after you've read that article, not because you know the person who authored or anyone who authored that article, you have unexpectedly, unilaterally written that author and told them what you liked or what challenged you about that work. Someone you didn't know. Have you ever done that? Oh, I love it. I think that's a magical thing. I confess that it's not something I've done. I've done it now once, but I'm challenging myself to do that. When I read an article and something in that resonates with me, write to that person. Tell them what it was about that. Start a personal connection with that 
author and their work and perhaps invite them to this community because I think that this community grows not because a university hires someone and pays them, but because they know someone in this world and in this work and this is where they begin to find a home. So I'd like to challenge uh, you to do that, all of us to begin to do that. And I'll close this part by saying when I think about community, one of the things we do is that a community is a collective. And recently I have begun to think about the parts of my life where I am unaware even of my limitations, and of course they are myriad. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about collective evaluation, as Catherine alluded to. What are some of the ways that we want to evaluate the same kinds of outcomes, using the same kinds of instruments, using the same language, and where is that difficult? And so where can we choose to try to do that? And where do we need to acknowledge that it's impossible or really difficult? And in doing that, I find I run into my own limitations. A small example is all of a sudden I notice that many of my colleagues are putting pronouns in the signatures of their emails. What? Didn't ever cross my mind. That's, uh, a, that's on me. That's totally on me. Uh, but I, I love it when something happens that blows my mind like that. In a, in a similar vein, uh, as I get to know the field of evaluation, I realize that there's an entire well-trod path of culturally responsive evaluation. And I've begun to try to understand what that might mean for me and in the work of the field. So I encourage us as individuals and collectively to acknowledge the places where we're unaware, to kindly and gently help each other become aware, and to collectively join that community and invite others to it. Thank you, all of you. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a different perspective, a little bit of a turn on the, the New Horizons piece. And I guess I'd like to focus on things that have been mentioned, the interdisciplinary nature of environmental education, and also the, the atten connection to global and attention to, attention to global issues and connection to global initiatives. And so I'm an extremely interdisciplinary scholar. Uh, I don't have any sort of home or discipline, and sometimes that's very disorienting, but I want to look at it as a positive, right, and, the, and about the, the possibility that it contains. So the other thing that I study, in addition to environmental education, is cultural ecosystem services, or the non-material benefits that people get from nature. So I'm part of this sort of conservation science community also and and in that as part of that work I've become involved in some global initiatives that are trying to assess what's going on with conservation what's going on at a global scale with ecosystems and this relates to the IPCC report that just came out yesterday uh, and what I'm interested in kind of suggesting as a new direction for EE is really trying to link with those kinds of initiatives in a more formal and 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 embedded way, and I don't know exactly what that looks like, and I don't know exactly what the research role in particular looks like, but I find it really exciting, and I'd love to have some of those conversations. And so I recently got involved with sort of the, the conservation side or the conservation version of the IPCC, which is called the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Quite a mouthful, but it's abbreviated IPBES. And what's interesting about that is that this initiative, it seems to me from having just started, just joined it six months ago, is that it's really trying to address these issues that Olivia and Clayton especially are, are talking about, uh, hege hegemony, whiteness, patriarchy, all of those things. I'm really impressed with how they're coming up in these conversations at a global scale, trying to assess what's going on with our ecosystems, what's going on with ecosystem services, and I, I really, I really want to explore how environmental education can play into those conversations. Because in the conversation, environmental education is coming up. People are mentioning it. People are asking for it a lot. And I'd love to see more engagement uh, with from the people in this room, from people in the environmental education community to, to sort of answer that call. And one thing that I think is really exciting about that is that of all of the disciplines, of all the fields that are studying the social aspects of the environment, um, environmental education to me seems to, in one way, be explicitly about change. And I feel like we need change. <laughs> At a global scale, we need change. And one of the things I love about environmental education is it's thinking about that and really rigorously digging into what that looks like and what does that mean and what, is it, what do we need to achieve that. 
So that's something that I, I, I would love to see more involvement with. And, and particularly with some of these initiatives, I think there's more and more attention in them to decentralizing power, to really explicitly focusing on different voices and how different voices are coming into play. And I think environmental education has a lot to offer that conversation, particularly uh, this emerging idea, it's probably not emerging, this idea that's been there, that, that EE is not about teaching a particular kind of relationship, it's not, not a particular way of interacting with the natural world, but of creating engaged citizens. And I think that core idea of creating informed, engaged citizens that are engaged in the community and engaged at other scales is a really important and interesting core nugget that has a lot to teach these global initiatives. So to me, that this, this, the approach that EE brings and that, that sort of very interdisciplinary, grounded, change-focused approach is what the world needs. And I feel like some of these international initiatives, they, they know that, they want it, and, and I, I think we can engage more with them and sort of offer the many tools that are based in decades of research and figure out what they need, offer to help with that research, and I'm really excited to see where that may go. Um, wow, there's a lot to digest. I don't know how you are all feeling, but even just being up here, um, there. I, I also I find it really energizing, and I hope you do too. Um, I think when I'm reflecting on New Horizons and kind of chatting with some of our with the panel before the before this presentation, um, one thing sort of struck out of those conversations is that I've, I feel like a new horizon is essentially that we've moved pretty far, or broadened, I, I should say, not moved away from, but kind of broadened out from what it seems to be a, a focus on um, education to for engaged citizens, but also with this explicit goal of pro-environmental behavior. And, and sort of pretty focused on biodiversity, conservation, and kind of coming out of that environmentalist movement. At least that's how I... Um, it seems to me, and now more and more and more, we're much more focused on the human, or it's, or I guess rather, rather than either, or it's more of a both and, right? Like we're focused on how can we, um, as humans, sort of support natural systems, but how, as environmental education researchers, how what is our contribution to also human systems, and how are all those connected? Um, which I find really, really exciting. Um, and I think to Rochelle's point, something that else that strikes me is that I do agree with you that resonates with me a lot that, that um, this point that environmental education is interdisciplinary and change oriented and I think also sort of um, acknowledging also the kind of the, the urgent uh, feeling of these times I guess and that I think our field really does have a lot to offer in that sense um, meaning I think we, we offer a perspective that can cross boundaries, that can attend to emergent um, ideas around liberation and transformation in ways that maybe other fields are not quite as equipped to because of our focus on interdisciplinarity and change. Um, and when I think of sort of what, what do we do with all of that, what does that mean for the way that we do our research, um, one thing that I think re that kind of keeps striking me, and Jason, I think you hit on this to some degree in the beginning, um, was when we think as researchers, as we're developing knowledge, right, that's what we're in the business of, right, is creating new knowledge. Um, how do we do that in a way that is responsive, um, meaning, how do we move away from simply identifying gaps that exist to identifying gaps that are strategic to move us forward somewhere, right? So I think, as far as the New Horizons, what this means for me as a researcher, which hopefully has some application to the field, is how do we remind, remain responsive in sort of our daily practices as researchers? Um, I think many of us, whether we're responding to funding opportunities or strategic collaborations in our own quest for tenure or whatever it is, um, how do we remain responsive and looking for questions that need to be answered? meaning what needs to be answered as a strategy for moving us somewhere we want to go, rather than what needs to be answered because somebody hasn't answered it yet. Um, so not only what are the bald spots, but what are the strategic bald spots to get us to where we need to go. Um, and as far as 
why we need to think about this, I think it's because, as everyone said, the, there, there's a lot going on right now that I think the world is really screaming for some help with. Um, I think that it's, whether it's issues that are more societal in nature versus the IPCC report, I think that we need to, we need to be in there and, and acting on that way. So what I guess my new horizon is thinking of ways and re, we as researchers can continually to push ourselves to contribute to these, um, these initiatives rather than just sort of our own scholarship. How do we situate that in a way that pushes the field to be more helpful and contributing in meaningful ways to these broader issues that I think are all on our minds? Excellent. Thank you all so much for those responses. So our um, final question then to pose to you is what barriers, if any, do you see as making this needed work more difficult? And what supports or strategies do you think will be critical in moving it forward? So back to you, Catherine. Okay. Um, so <laughs> the, I think we were also, before, just before this, we were saying, ugh, barriers, there's a lot, right? <laughs> so I think that thinking about this, it, it's, it can, at least to me, can quickly feel really heavy, right? I think this work is really, really difficult. And also, also, Jason, when you were speaking, I was like, ah, oh, he's stealing on my talking points. I think the, the strategies that at least I find helpful for overcoming kind of the myriad of barriers that I don't think we have time to enumerate right here um, is um, the sense that I think we do, or at least I gain a lot of strength from this community in particular. I think we all draw, draw strength from whatever communities we're, um, we are a part of. But I think something that I value of the CE research community in particular is how collaborative and generally open this community is. Um, we were all at dinner last night. We were saying how much we this is our kind of our favorite conference because it is so interactive, and the whole purpose is to talk about. Um, research and progress. So it's not saying, this is what I knew, let me share it from you. It's coming with a posture of, I don't really know all the answers, so can you help me, right? And that is an incredibly powerful and supportive asset that I think we have that I think we don't, we can't underestimate in preparing us to sort of do this difficult work. So I think the first strategy I have is just um, relying on your community, right? So using this week as, to, as a, a, a way to draw strength to carry us forward um, and kind of staying in touch and um, of just realizing what an asset that the relationships that we're building in this room are to drive us forward. Um, the second strategy that I've been thinking about um, when, I, when I think about how can we make sure that our, our work is helpful in a way that, that means something to the world is, um, is more of a, a, it's a question of posture, but I think I'd argue it's a powerful one in that, um, so I guess what I mean is, is entering this, this work with a pro posture of more of how can I help. So it's, um, I think we as researchers, obviously there's a lot of talent in this room, there's a lot of power in this room, there's, there's a lot of, you know, we have a pretty strong voice or can, so with that I think comes some responsibility. So if we really are intending to enter this work in a way that moves the field forward, I think a posture of what can, what can I do, right? Here are all the talents that I have, not how can I um, contribute in the way that I, is important to my own scholarship, but how can I use what I have to help move the for field forward. And I think with that can come um, a sense of humility and a sense of being willing to be really challenged and pushed by the community, but also um, doing but also looking for ways that you can contribute meaningfully. Um, I think we all come from different methodological traditions and training traditions and just outlooks on research and how this works. So it I think Entering with a posture of how I can help to me means um, you're recognizing your own strengths and saying hey, where can I apply these? Not trying to be everyone, everything to everyone, but saying how can I kind of pragmatically use my strengths and talents to make a difference, um, kind of where I am, but also relying on my community to push me farther and figure out kind of how we can how we can work together. So, thank you. So, barriers, uh, I want to remind you that the, the one, two of the things I've mentioned, that one was this wide net of EE, sort of this idea that the EE umbrella has become even bigger, and the second thing I, one of the other things I mentioned was connecting to global sustainability conversations. And so, 
sort of barriers for the first bit about the wide net, I think we've all thought about and are pretty pretty obvious, which is that where where do we draw the line? Right? And I think these conversations have been happening for a long time, and, and I do think that's an important challenge. Where, where do the boundaries of EE um, start and end? And as we, as we re recognize the total intertwined nature of social justice issues and community development issues and all of this, like what, what does it mean to be doing environmental education? And I think those are exciting conversations, and again, they've been happening, and to me it's not as much about a definition of environmental education, but what the tools that we're creating and the, the questions that we're asking, what are the, what's the suite of issues to which they're relevant? So I don't have an answer to that, and I think it's something we'll just continue to discuss and have as a bit of a tension, but also a place for exciting expansion opportunity. And in terms of the, the inclusion in the sustain, global sustainability conversations, I just want to echo something Catherine said, is that we need to get in there. I just really like that phrasing. That's essentially what I meant, so thank you. We just need to get in there. And, and so the challenges to that, the, so there's a publication that's been with me for years that I think really best encapsulates the, the challenges as I see them. And it came out of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which is 10 years, 13 years ago, um, global and global assessment, trying to bring a bunch of different knowledge experts together, et cetera. And they, a sort of side publication was called Bridging Scales and Knowledge Systems. And it's available online for free. It's a amazing publication because I think it identifies these just recurring issues that pop up all the time in environmental work of all types, particularly right now. And so bridging scale, again, something that we've talked about a lot. It's not a new challenge, but this whole idea of EE is often very community-based. It's based in local initiatives, and I think that's hugely important. And, and thinking about how that relates to these global conversations and these global issues is a constant challenge and, uh, and opportunity. And then the knowledge systems bit, is so deep and meaningful, and, and another point that's been made here is the importance of humility with that, and recognizing that a lot of the work that a lot of us have read, much of it has been based in Western science, Western knowledge, Western traditions, and just the crucial importance of looking beyond that, and that we, we need those different sources of knowledge, and I think we're really there, we're really there, we're really at the cusp of including that knowledge, and I find it really exciting, and the ways that, that knowledge systems are being integrated is, Again, uh, uh, it's a tension and it's a barrier, maybe, but I actually think it's not a barrier. I think the integration maybe is a bit of a barrier. We just need to think about how to do it, but it's a huge source of potential. And there are lots of people in this room who are working on them. One of them is sitting right here, Mar Marcia, integrating these different knowledge systems that it's happening and it's really exciting. So again, a bit of a barrier, but really more of an opportunity. As we think about this, all of these barriers, we want to support each other, and in essence, supporting each other in part becomes collective action, because we're supporting people to do what they want to do sometimes. Perhaps it's not exactly what we want to do. Um, and that collective evaluation, if we uh, collective action, if we take as a premise that from that, we want to be able to share broadly what the impact is of that action, that impact of our field, then that requires us coming back around to think about collective outcomes and collective measures, collective language, collective instruments. And um, the difficulty, the barrier that I, I want to point out is that at, at once that you want to do things that is the same so that you can share widely, there comes a point where you have to pay attention to the individualized context where things are, and you have to be true to the community or the collective that you are supporting, in which you're taking action, and where you're evaluating. And I think um, there's a tension there that's really difficult when it comes to telling that story, and I really welcome the opportunity to talk with you all more about your ideas about that tension, uh, when to acknowledge it, when to try and bust through that barrier. Uh, and I think there are times when we don't try to bust through that barrier, but to acknowledge it. And even in acknowledging it, there are difficulties. Perhaps there is a community in which we want to work, in which I want to work, and that's just not possible for me to do that authentically and well, given who I am. So do I find a promotora, someone to help me in that? And then how do I do that in a way that is um, true and not uh, using that resource in a way that's uh, uns uh, unsustainable. So I um, throw that out as a, um, as a barrier and something I hope we can continue to talk about. Okay, I'm gonna actually keep time this time. 
I forgot last time, sorry guys. Um, so I think a lot of the challenges that I have thought about have, have been raised again, but um, one of the things that Catherine said that I found really compelling was the notion of entering this work with a posture of humility, I, ca I think I captured your quote, um, asking how can I pragmatically use ah, my talents to make a difference. Um, I think that's a really important question, but also a challenge for us because, and this goes back to what Marcia pointed out at the beginning, um, we're all coming to this work from different angles, and I, I think respecting those angles is going to be a big challenge and not necessarily, especially, you know, we have something that we feel is very important. I, I feel like I come to this work because I want to make an impact. Um, and obviously I have a personal bias that the impact I'm trying to make is probably the most important impact, right? So, um, so how do I then take a step back in humility and recognize that other people are coming to this work from other places? I, I think that's, that's a challenge and that's a big question for us as we move forward especially given the interdisciplinarity and given, um, again, given sort of the different reasons we come to this work. Um, I think another challenge um, is certainly, you know, what I called for earlier is this notion towards human liberation, and I think um, we also have to do that within our field, and perhaps one of the places is methodologically, and what we're um, able to explore methodologically, and how we can assure that, that our methods are also not oppressive, um, I think will be another challenge for us, because, because we talk about methods so much, right? Um, so I think that'll be another challenge for us. I think there are possible paths and options um, as we move towards the future, but I think, again, what I hope is that we are um, recognizing that those can take various forms. Uh, and then finally, I would say, I think a challenge for us has to be that a field that often, I think when we think about the history of our field, we often sort of come out of this science education sort of orientation. And it's perhaps hard to see the, the need or space for vulnerability and empathy in that, in that lens. So I think the challenge is really to create spaces of vulnerability and empathy for people in this work. And again, that sort of goes uh, back to my point about human liberation, but how are we doing that um, as researchers um, when we just have discussions, but then also in our, in our research, where is the place for, for vulnerability and empathy? Um, so those are some of the big challenges I see to our work as we go forward. All right, this is a hard question. I didn't know where to start as well. I'm gonna uh, try to build off uh, my colleague's statements as well. I was stuck in, um, Nietzsche's aphorism, or one of his aphorisms that says, um, this is the best of all possible worlds, says the optimist. I know, said the pessimist. So I'm sort of in between there and sort of looking for a way out of that. Um, and the way I approach sort of this uh, bar barriers and strategy question um, was trying to ground it in the work I think that I'm doing now. As I mentioned, um, over the last two years I've been working at Western's campus farm, the Outback Farm, in particular working on questions around food insecurity on campus. So this is sort of um, one big conversation going on around college campuses. I think 25% of undergraduate students are food insecure on campus. So thinking about ways to use sites like the Outback Farm as an environmental education space that um, can bring to bear and bring into practice um, a place to solve and think about environmental justice um, problems on campus, but then also that extends beyond campus. So one of the big barriers I see in that work um, is the ability to hold institutions accountable to the required work of environmental justice demands and needs of students and communities on campus. Um, I'd say that higher ed institutions are excellent, very good, at blocking, redirecting, ignoring, and simply denying resources and support for faculty, students, and communities working to realize environmental justice goals on campuses and campus communities. Um, for example, we're working on, and students are really driving this work at Western, on getting rid of the food contract for the campus, which is run by Aramark. Um, look up Aramark if you're interested. Um, they're involved in lots of things as well as um, they make a lot of their money from the prison industrial complex. So um, that's sort of one concrete area we're working on, but also um, pushing back on institutions, holding them to um, accountability, but also linking food security conversations to food security in food desert communities around us, as well as um, indigenous communities like the Lemmy Nation that are um, constantly and have been working for hundreds of years on their own food security and issues related to that. So how do we build, again, relationships 
um, with other communities um, while also holding institutions accountable and demanding resources as well and not being ignored. Um, so I think part of this also connects to changing the terms. So this would be in the strategy um, part, I guess, of my comments. Uh, we also need to change the terms of how we define and practice things such as how we use this language in especially, again, I'm thinking in the context of our education, health, diversity, community partnership, so not service learning, but really rethinking those definitions in sort of this broader sense um, that can take into account environmental justice problems that really students um, and community members are pushing for and leading the way on. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and so I want to also connect this to another question. This is more speculative or something I'm really thinking about. Somebody might have already thought about this, so I, do, I can't claim it's an original idea, but I'm really starting to think about what would an environmental education model look like that's based in reparations. Um, so in other words, what would it look like to work from an ethic of reparations in environmental education? Um, I'm really thinking through that. I don't know what that would look like, but it seems to me that would be a good starting point um, for some of the sort of big challenges and new directions uh, that I laid out there. Um, and I want to leave it there. That's what I'm really thinking about right now as a strategy and working Do with Do you students. want to explain what you mean by reparations? Yeah, reparations. So I think there's a broader conversation going on around reparations of, of what we can do, and I want to say what we can do. So um, conversations, for example, that I have with um, white students on campus is what is my space and what is sort of the ethical position I can take um, doing environmental justice work. We have conversations about re reparations. So reparations essentially being um, how can I work to give back? Um, how do I honor, um, and I think this is really where it points to reparation, um, the acknowledgement that we're on stolen and occupied land, for example, what would that, so that's like one part of just acknowledging it, and what can we do in terms of work? And I'm talking about uh, material work. Um, so growing things, building things, um, redistributing and redirecting resources from institutions to communities that know what they need and know what they need for many years. So that would be examples of practices of reparation. Again, I'm really, this is something I'm speculating on and thinking through right now, so, yeah. Excellent. Thank you all so much for your, all your responses. Um, I'm sure everyone has sort of connected to different pieces and could pull together um, different threads that have um, meaning for you and, and the work that you're wanting to do. A few things that uh, are kind of jumping out for me and what, and what I'm hearing from across the panelists is uh, kind of this call or push uh, to the field as well as be encouraged uh, by recent work in this area in terms of uh, looking not just at environmental issues in isolation but considering the ways that they're intersectional including in relation to the the land that we're doing environmental ed on and uh, in places like the US and Canada which is settler colonial uh, land and um, different things that Clay was just talking about, what that, what that means for how we engage in, in environmental ed, what is environmental ed uh, in terms of intersectional issues, in terms of land-based issues, um, and really continuing to push the work both within the environmental ed research field, I think, in terms of intersectional issues and leadership and um, different things there, as well as in the work that we do as environmental education and, and pushing that. Uh, the second thing that's um, jumping out for me is around the need to be more strategic. And uh, I really liked what you're saying, Rochelle, around the intergovernmental biodiversity work and uh, the spaces like that, what we can offer as a field. And I had a similar thing where in a conversation with Environment and Climate Change Canada, where they have new science communication staff. They don't know anything about environments led. They're scientists. They're like, what can you tell us? And then I'm like, oh, what can I tell you, you know? And I, and I think, you know, one point is in either of those areas, like we can't all carry the flag for all these things on our own, right? But so we can't even carry the flag for one of these things on our own. So it's, I think, you know, many of you made the point about the importance of uh, collaboration and supporting each other, um, like you were saying, Charlotte, in terms of, well, Rochelle needs some backup to pull some stuff together for the intergovernmental panel. 
let us know what do people have, we put it together, or, you know, Olivia's got something she wants to do, call in people and we can help support something that um, needs needs to be go forward. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I always think of um, Bill Scott, uh, who's a long time EE uh, research community member um, from the UK and he, he um, has you know this great quote that I love about you know as re an EU research community are we doing enough like at the end of the day and so I always think of that call and I hope you know I really appreciate the the passion and um, you know honesty and smarts that all the panelists have brought to really asking us to what we can all be doing how we can be working together more to to make more of a difference in these different spheres um, and something Judy talked about yesterday was uh, the value of making sure we're having significant conversations while we're here, that we're not just talking about the weather or, oh yeah, I'm doing this, you know, little project or here's, you know, I'm into this, but really making the most of the conversations we're having to move forward some of these things. And um, I really like Charlotte's idea of, of um, you know, making sure we're acknowledging or sending people, starting these conversations, say, with people we write. And I take that as an invitation to all of you to, I'm sure there are things that the panelists said this morning that you connected with. So to come up and talk with them and maybe build some of these coalitions and collaborations more and amongst yourself and have those, those significant conversations. So um, with that in mind, we have a few uh, minutes to open up for some comments from the floor or other uh, things that may not have come up that you see as really key for uh, the future uh, directions, new horizons of the EU research. So is anyone that would like to ask a question or make a comment? Okay, and I'll bring the mic towards you. Okay, you can start talking if you want. I'm wondering, in looking yourself. at... Introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. I'm Roberta Hunter. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Rutgers University. And um, in looking at developing community and reaching out to be inclusive to other people, you know, I'm really trying to, you know, we're all in the situation of being the lone wolf at our institution in building these virtual communities. And so, you know, I have a virtual community with Charlotte and some other uh, researchers, but I was wondering if you could share like your your Twitter handles and that type of thing, so I can follow and see what's going on, you know, in other researchers' lives. So, someone want to address that, or you know, I don't know, type your Twitter handles on the screen. I just deleted my Facebook account. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Kartika Sarabhai from the Center for Environment Education in India. Uh, I like that comment on um, what the world is really looking for. And one of the things we wonder from outside the US is how come there's so much cynicism on science itself? When, when we were students, uh, social science was looked upon with some questions, whether that's really science or not. But hard sciences were never questioned. Uh, today, when you hear the, the rhetoric, the dialogue in the U.S., uh, and you were mentioning IPCC, and I, I mean, the IPCC report, for a large part of the population was probably reading it in the U.S., feels, oh, yeah, that's one more opinion. And, and what's happening is, I mean, even for us from outside to see the whole debate on, on the Supreme Court here, uh, seeing how politicized a debate like that is, which in other countries is really not. It's the, the judiciary is completely separate. But here you, you see politics getting into sports, it, you're, getting, you're seeing it in, in, in research, and, and just the lack of belief in science. I was wondering where that comes from, and when, does, <laughs> when, when do people, when do students, for instance, do children who go to school, do they, do they question the validity of science? Um, it, does it happen afterwards? After they, after they join the general public, when, when, do, when do you start becoming so science cynical uh, in, in the US? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to take that. Um, because I teach college students and let me be clear that although I think there's, I think there's room to critique Western science, 
but I also fully use Western science. I think you, I don't have, I don't think it has to be an either or. I think it's important to recognize the value in various ways of coming to knowledge. And, but your question is, so where do students start to sort of learn this thing? And I teach freshman college students on the importance of science, and I, I don't know where it comes from in the, in the pipeline, but, um, but I think what I try to do is really hope that they understand a Western science model so that they can use it appropriately, but then also have the critical thinking skills to be able to question whose knowledge does that benefit? What, what cultural um, groups, what places does that benefit? And then also be open to other ideas of, of knowledge and where those come from. I think it's important to be able to do both of those things. So maybe I'm asking a lot of my students to be able to value both, but, but I, think, I think that that's important. So that's all, that's all I'd say about that. I, I totally agree. And I think that this, this is the knowledge system's point, is that there are multiple ways of understanding reality. Um, and that, that question about science is such a huge question um, that I think all of us are probably thinking about all the time. One thing I think that EE has to offer there is this idea of sort of getting students to to look at reality themselves and to do the work themselves and to work through, you know, an example I've worked on with Jen here in the audience is, is the example of climate change and having students look at the changes over time in snowpack and tree rings and, and looking at the changes themselves and coming to conclusions themselves. So that's one quick thing I'll offer that EE has. Hi. I think I appreciate your question and I think it's bigger. My perspective is I, I, I agree with what the panelists are saying, but I think what I'd offer too is I think is my understanding of, of how I view sort of the U.S. context is people don't trust science because it's not how we, it's, it, it's, it's, it just seems so wrapped up in, in our questions of identity and tribalism that seems to have taken over the U.S. <laughs> and so I think it's not, it's uh, the way you, whether you trust science or not has become a part of people's identity is the way that I see it. Um, and it's something that I think a lot about in my own research. I mean, I, I just kind of ta I just finished talking about how appreciative I am of this community, and I, I really am. But I think that, and I think there is a diversity of perspectives but I also think of um, one line of work that, I work that I'm interested in right now is kind of connecting ag ed and environmental ed communities. And I think that is a good, <laughs> that, that is a good example for me anyway of how I realize one sector of the population that is often not in these communication communities really is kind of conservative communities that I think some of us in this room and myself included have a hard time wrapping around. Like, how do you not trust peer-reviewed science? Like, how hard is that, right? But I think that it is wrapped up in identities, and I would, um, I guess, in line with um, entering this work with a posture of humility and curiosity and seeking to understand, I think maybe that can be helpful in that context um, in identifying commonalities um, in ways that uh, can foster a conversation before it gets shut down from the get-go. Um, and. I, I feel like this answer is sort of circuitous to your point to some degree, but I guess what I'm, I'm saying is, is that I think those types of questions uh, raise for me questions of who are we as a community and who are we not talking to? And I think as we think about when we, before we kind of respond of like kind of in a dismissive way, and I'm not saying you were or, but I think I, I do, right? I say like, ah, oh, how can you not trust the science? But it's, I think it's about larger than that and how can we approach this work in ways that um, make people feel safe and included and heard, um, kind of no matter how they come to this conversation. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to say this clearly or effectively, but part of the problem with trusting science is that even some of, I'll speak for myself, even for myself, as I have gotten older, I have found more and more places where there is science that I shouldn't have trusted. And so we want our students to think critically. Um, and so then when you start to be a good judge of science, which we want people to do, then sometimes it's difficult 
to take the time to know when the science is trustworthy because it does take time and effort to do that. So um, again, it's not to dismiss the point, and I am an, a very high user of science, but I am remembering a set of emails that went around the Nicholas School at Duke where a, uh, one faculty member was rebuffing our dean for taking an advocacy opinion in a personal blog post and another faculty member wrote back and this then got sent to all the students and went way beyond the faculty uh, saying, you know, you are uh, taking an advocacy position every time you choose which grant to even, where to propose to get your funding, you are making an advocacy statement in that way. So again, that was a little circular. Um, because I, I do want us to critique science, and then I also want us to trust science at, at the same time. Um, and and just to add on that, I guess so. When it gets to the point of climate change denialism, like <laughs> that, it's uh, beyond that. And I think maybe what Catherine's referring to with the identities, uh, just sort of, a, you know, if you take Naomi Klein's work for example on this, this commitment to a, a particular way of life, a capitalist way of life that is not actually compatible with making the changes we need to make uh, so that we're really in, you know, invested in that and need to look at it at that level which you know, Clayton's written uh, has a good book talking about that that you should check out. So we have time for one more question. I think uh, you had your hand up there first. So. Well, just going off or comment. the question. Okay. Um, yeah, my specialty is studying elementary science education and, and environmental education. And it's one thing to look at science critically when you are educated. It's another thing to not be educated in any science. And that's what's happening at the elementary level in the United States. They're putting emphasis on language arts and math. That's what's tested. Um, science is not tested until fifth grade. So they get busy in fifth grade. And they do vocabulary, memorization. So they're not learning science and there's a political effort to discredit science that is in the news. So that's what we're fighting against. I wish there were an environmental educator in every school. And we just had one more addition onto this conversation here. Yeah, this is a just, I want to add also to your question coming from India. I can see how in a lot of countries you're just baffled, like, how can they be doing that in the United States? But we ask those same questions. Um, and there is actually a whole science studying your question. Um, there is a very good book called Merchants of Doubt, which I recommend to you. Um, that looks at a very systematic, very well-funded project over many years to sow doubt about science in the minds of the U.S. public. And I, I accept everything that you've been saying. It's all very real. Um, but there is this happening in addition, and um, it's also a piece of the answer to your question. There's also a National Research Council um, study on public understanding of science that might be useful. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, Charlotte wants to say something else. <laughs> I, I just want to circle back around to Roberta's comment and, and say that we'll figure out some way to put a flip chart paper up at the back so that anyone who'd like to share a Twitter handle with their name uh, can do so because I'm sure there's many of you in the audience I'd love to follow as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm so impressed by uh, the commentaries that you folks made. And thank you so much for all the work that you put in. And, and hopefully uh, people can take that up and have some conversations with these folks and amongst yourself that build on it. So we'll have a little break. And then the next uh, session starts at quarter two. And I think you have five choices or six choices where to go. So enjoy. Thank you.